So, yeah. Um, so thanks for having me. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I didn't even know we were rolling, but awesome, man. Yeah. Thanks. Also, thanks for helping me promote the event. Yeah. You and Nick were actually one of the biggest helps this year, believe it or not. Um, you guys really stuck it out. Even though it was only a few times, it was massive every time. So. Oh, cool. Appreciate it. Awesome. Good stuff, awesome. man. Thanks. Uh, I don't want to take yeah. the water. Take it away. Sure. Yeah, awesome. Thanks. So I am going to read a little bit off um, the Blackbeard here, a la like Nick with the iPhone. But um, again, thanks everybody for coming out. I'll try to make this as like informative as possible. Here's sort of what I'm going to be talking about today is just a five minute background of myself. Um, go into a little bit of high level stuff about like the way I think about like being a man and being good with this stuff. And then I'm going to talk about some techniques. And then I'm going to talk about being a man again. And uh, just to give you all some context, I turned 30 in mid-August. So is there anybody in the room older than me? One, two, three, four, five. Awesome. Cheers, guys. Um, but there are some people here who are younger than me. And uh, I think the big thing that I've learned over the years, so to give you some background to how I got into this, um, I, I dropped out of college at 20, started a software company, and uh, one of my employees found the community, and he discovered Juggler. Uh, you may or may not know that name if you read the game. And so Juggler was in Michigan. Uh, I got introduced to him, and we started a business together called Charisma Arts. And we kind of blew that up, it got real big. And uh, then in 2006, I moved to New York. He and I didn't really see eye to eye on what we were doing, and we bounced, we split public paths. And uh, two years later, I started what's called The Social Man. And we've had the opportunity to connect with some really amazing people. Uh, you know, these guys, most, uh, most geographically located here. Um, but, uh, but also just like, I don't know, a bunch of people in the back. I did an interview with Adonis back there. Nick, what time are you talking tomorrow? I uh, spoke yesterday. Actually. Oh, shit, sorry, man. Rearranged. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we just talked with him regarding the reason launch. If you guys have a DVD in your hand, we just like spent six months doing this program called Unbreakable that um, for me, the biggest issue going through this stuff, like, is Charisma Arts had some really good stuff. Have any of you guys read, like, Juggler stuff? Okay, so, yeah, cool, all right. So, it was really good stuff, but there were a lot of questions that I felt were unanswered in terms of, like, where your instincts really drive your conversations. And um, I always, like, did okay with girls in, like, when I met them, but I had a really hard time when I actually had to go out and pick them up. And there was this level of like situational confidence that I like really, really lacked. Uh, and that would just be going into a bar, I'd get like real nervous, like clam up, and just, you know, get, get weird about stuff and probably creep some girls out. So it took me a long time to figure this stuff out. Nowadays, we're running boot camps every two weeks. We're like real happy. Nick and I both had active social lives. As you can see from Nick, he's like, Nick kind of knows what he's doing. And uh, so I'm real happy to be working with him. But in terms of, again, uh, you know, kind of where I am right now, what I want to talk to you about today. Um, more about, like, at least at the start, kind of like where we all are together collectively in this room. <coughs> and uh, there's this guy back in New York, and it kind of alluded to this, we're both from Manhattan. And we kind of party with some interesting people. Um, we go out in these, like, wild, crazy nightclub scenes. And you get some real cool people, and you get some, like, vampires there as well. And there's a particular guy in mind uh, he is about 32, he's a total coke fiend, uh, he is a vampire, and uh, he's got all sorts of other <coughs> very positive redeeming personality traits. He uh, made himself sort of a fixture at our, at our apartment as a result of uh, certain girls who we were hanging out with. And he would come along, he would kind of, he was very good at like buttering people up, making the girls feel good about themselves, and like just, you know, telling them all the things they wanted to hear. And there was one day, well, he knows about what I do. There was one day I threw him out of our apartment because he's uh, not a good person. And on his way out, he told me, you know what, dude? You are the king of the losers and you always will be. He was referring to my job and what I'm doing and all of us in this room right now. And uh, of all the things that anybody's ever said to me about this profession, which it has become for myself and for Nick, we do this nonstop every day, all day, that was the most offensive. And it was most unfortunate considering the source it came from, a 32-year-old broke-ass coke addict who like, just bounces around from party to party to party and kind of you know, gets by merely on the fact that he flatters a hot, new hot girl every like six months and manages to get into her good graces. 
And it really made me think about this, though, because it's like, you know, I was supposed to be a lawyer when I grew up, and, and, and I'm, I'm doing this. And it was like, well, is this, a, is this an honorable profession? Is this an honorable thing that we are all doing together, sitting here trying to figure out? And the answer to my mind is yes, and I'm going to tell you why that is um, in a moment. But it also got me thinking about what is a winner and what is a loser. And I spent some time kind of writing this down. You know, it's like we've all been presented with a challenge. And, and I'm no different, I think, than anybody in here in the sense that, you know, there was a point in my life where I said, I'm not getting what I want with women in my life. And uh, I don't think there's anybody <coughs> here except for perhaps Erica who can't say the same, but I don't know about your proclivities, so I don't want to judge. Um, but, you know, the point is we're either not getting what we want or we want more. And when that's a situation with which you're confronted in life, whether it be in work or in your personal life or spiritually or what have you, um, there's two paths that you can take. And the first path is, of course, you know, I'm going to go out, I'm going to do everything I can and try to improve myself. Or the second path is I'm going to put myself into the um, lowest resistance situations possible. I'm going to try to skate by. I'm going to do the least work <coughs> possible to not have to feel any pain. And that's exactly what this guy back in, Ann Ar or back in uh, New York does. So he tries to do the least work possible, escape by with his fucking life, and feel no pain. That's why he drugs himself up. That's why he pops from party to party to party. As you can tell, I'm not a big fan of this person, but I think he reflects the exact opposite of what everybody in here is. He, to my mind, lacks virtue. And he's a loser to me. A loser is a man who takes what he can get in life, who does the least work, who just fucking floats by. And a winner is a man who refuses to accept his situation and who does something about it. And so I want to say thank you. I'm not just trying to butter you guys up, but I really want you to internalize this. And I want you to feel this. Thank you for all of you for being here and for coming out for Anthony, a dream, sorry, and for, uh, you know, for listening to all of us. I, there's people with laptops. I mean, like, that's some, that's some work right there. Um, you're not just, like, chilling, you know? Um, there's people taking notes. So, again, thank you to all of you for, like, actually putting in the work and, and coming to this event. Um, yeah. 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 Right, and one of, one of the biggest leaps that I've personally had to make, because, again, I didn't intend to be in this community to be studying all this material as I have and, and now to be speaking to a group of people. Uh, one of the biggest leaps I had to make was legitimizing this to myself and was to say, like, you know, this is something that I can not only not hide behind, but actually lead with in my own life. So I tell all my friends about what I do. They see my website. Uh, there are certain <coughs> things that I write about that are kind of hidden behind, you know, certain closed doors, because I don't want every girl in my life to know about them, but I lead with what I do. And I'm very proud of it, and I'm very proud of all of us here for like taking this step and saying that we are not happy with where we are, or we want it better, and that we're going to do something about it. And that dovetails very well into a man's journey through life. And in my 30 or so years on this planet, um, I've spent a lot of time thinking about uh, why are we all here, um, and maybe deeper questions than the things that brought us here immediately today. In the last maybe six months, I've been reading a lot of uh, Stoic philosophy, memoirs of Roman emperors, and, uh, and other such. Uh, very interesting reading material. But it's really made me think about um, what, is, what is my purpose? You know, what, what is all of our purposes? And how does picking up women fit into this? Because Lord knows I've spent the last four, five, six years now uh, studying this stuff and teaching it. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and it's like if you've spent four, five, six years of your life, and that represents maybe, you know, a third to a fifth of your life doing something, then it's got to have some meaning for you. Um, who here has been doing this for more than like a year, just out of curiosity? Okay, so it's a fair number, and there's a fair number who are fairly new, and I hope you don't spend too much time here. But um, for me, this really became about a lot more than picking up girls and meeting girls, and I'm going to get back to that material in a second, but I want to start by talking about this. So when I think about a man's journey through life, I think about three sort of macro areas that he has to work through. And the first one is his personal life. 
Okay, and that's what we're all here for. We're all trying to make our personal lives better. No one's here listening to Fran talk about wealth management or listening to, this is David, by the way, he's fucking awesome, um, listening to David talk about how to find God. That's not why we're here. We're here because we're talking about our personal lives. And in your personal lives, there's a whole lot of things that you need to get right. And I spent a lot of my 20s messing up things in my personal life, uh, not for lack of... Uh, not for lack of uh, bad guidance, but just because I'm very stubborn and it takes me a long time to learn things. So, you know, what goes into mastery and contentment of your personal life? I think one of the most important things is finding out who you are, finding out what your values are, finding out what you want and will accept out of people and what you won't. And, you know, this really goes into how you interact with women. One of the hardest things for me to do, Nick kind of joked about that whole, you know, uh, you sure you can come up if you want. You got beer for me? Um, we can't have, we can't bring that stage, but um, so Nick kind of joked about like the whole like dating models thing, and and frankly that was something that for a while was very very important to me. Um, and I, I chased that when I got to New York. I like chased that and I chased this whole notion of like dating models and surrounding myself with beautiful girls, and that was my values. That was like what I wanted for myself. And in one way, it was awesome, and I would never not want that to have happened before. But another way, like, it was a little bit silly. And so finding, through dating women, through experiencing who these people are, finding who I was, was a big test for myself. And the closer that you get to people, the more that you learn about yourself. I hope I'm not putting people to sleep here. This is deeper stuff. Um, you know, another issue that maybe we've all struggled with is the um, lessons that our fathers taught us. I don't know, I, I don't want to presume anything about the relationships that you all had with your fathers. Mine is uh, one of the finest specimens of a human being that I could ever imagine and did everything in his power to uh, inculcate certain values in me to be a good person. Um, the challenge that I think many of us faced growing up is that uh, our fathers were doing the best they could to put bread on our table and to provide something for our family and we're not able to deal with some of the cultural changes that have swept through America, you know, maybe through Europe, that's really through the world in the last 15, 20 years with respect to how people communicate with each other, respect to male, female sexual dynamics. And as, as we are now men and entering, you know, this new age where all this information is available to us, we realize women have advanced a long way, you know, in the last 30, 40 years. And the values that our fathers grew up with as children and they brought into adulthood and that they taught us are not the same values necessarily that we need to continue on as men. Or at the very least, they were not able culturally to provide us with the context and the understanding of what we were dealing with in lower school, in middle school, et cetera, et cetera, because they were doing a good job being the men that they thought they needed to be. And uh, you know that's, that's a difficult thing to, to sort of wrestle with, is growing up and finding these models of masculinity in our lives. And that's why I think many, many of us have reached out to movies like Fight Club. Um, what are some other ones? Uh, Ocean's Eleven is a great movie with male archetypes. Uh, there's another with 300. I mean, if anybody in this room thought 300 was anything less than an awesome, awesome movie about how awesome it is to be a man, I'd, I'd be shocked. Um, so, you know, we, we've looked for these things because maybe we haven't found them as close to home as we've wanted. And so now we're all here today trying to figure out, you know, how do we find this in our lives. Um, and then we move on because we find out a little bit about who we are and we try to enjoy our single lives as much as possible. And for me, the last three, four, five years of living in New York have been at the peril of my financial and, and business uh, success, but have been a whirlwind of personal success. And I surrounded myself with incredibly beautiful people. I went out, I had these vampires around me as I described them. I went to these crazy nightclubs. I partied in places that I, you know, sort of dreamed about in ways that I only thought existed in like music videos. And that was an important thing for me to enjoy. And to a certain degree, I'm still enjoying my single life as best as possible. I had three dates this week leading up to this uh, before we left today. So I'm really trying to make the most of my single life as a man in his 20s. And as Nick sort of said, with probably a little more energy than I have right now, just fucking do it. And that's such an important part of this journey of getting our single lives going. <coughs> In fact, I would say, if you're anything like me, that getting this part of your life handled is probably something that has to happen before you can achieve any sort of 
uh, freedom in your professional life or freedom in your spiritual life or really any breakthroughs because I know for me, so I mentioned I started the software company at 20. I was making a fair amount of money at that time. I was working my ass off. I had every trapping of success like you could really imagine. But I was so unhappy with my personal life and I had so much I had to prove to myself. And that infected my ability to really be successful in business and to really give myself 100% to that business. And if you look at any relationship in life, whether it be your relationship with a woman you just met at a bar, as we were talking about earlier, a relationship with a woman who you've been dating for five years, a relationship with your business, with your boss, uh, if you're spiritual with God, uh, that is the, the best you can do is to give to that 100%. <coughs> And if you are unable to do that because something else is dragging you away because it's focusing your attention elsewhere, which it certainly was for me in my personal life in the pursuit of women, then it really infects your ability to have success in those other areas of your life. So enjoying your single life and getting those kicks out of your system and doing whatever you need to do, as Nick said, whether it be keg stands or um, you know, your, your period of, of craziness, um, you know, whatever you need to do to enjoy it is something that I think a lot of us have to go through. And whether that happens at 15 or 30, or <coughs> ask a man who's going through a midlife crisis at 40 what's really going on, he'll tell you there's a part of my life that I didn't live out when I was 20 years old. And that's why they go out and they go to sports cars. So that's a really big important part of it. Another big important part of your personal life is managing your finances. And as somebody who managed my finances at my own peril for a very long time because I was out chasing girls and throwing money at various like, you know, bottle services when I would go out to nightclubs, <coughs> buying those clothes when I really couldn't afford them, all for the sake of trying to be more attractive to the opposite sex because I needed to solve this problem in my personal life. I wasn't managing my finances properly. And that really held me back as I started to get closer to women I started to develop more serious relationships that really held me back from any sort of longevity that I could try to offer those. Um, I need some water? All right, cool. Um, and again, if you guys have comments or like whatever, you know, pop in, there's a mic right there. Um, and, you know, so the next part of this evolution in our personal lives, what is it? It's, in my mind, it's love. And I kind of alluded to this earlier. It's the ability to be very open with yourself and to love something or someone without reserve. And I'm reading a, uh, I'm reading a book right now, I thought this was just uh, the absolutely most poetic, beautiful way to put this, is um, you know, love is openness and acceptance of yourself and another. And every bliss achieved together is a masterpiece. And specifically what this author was referring to was the sexual relationship of two people coming together. And if any of you have ever experienced true love and, and sexual love and two people coming together, it's not just like <coughs> fucking, but it's true intimacy, and it's true passion. Like, not, that is nothing more than surrender. And the only way that you're really able to surrender yourself to a person is if you feel comfortable opening yourself up and showing them who you really are. And again, I don't know what all of you have been through. I've got some scars in my life. I've been through some tough things um, professionally and personally. And it has at various points been very hard for me to open myself up to people, uh, even intimately. And so solving some of these things is an important path. Um, long term, building a family and leaving a legacy for people. And again, whatever your personal goals are, whatever values you find, I know that in my path is eventually a family. And eventually I want my values, my personal values, the things that I've learned through my life to be something that I share with them. And the very important thing here is I'd never want to be that grandpa who says, back in my day, we did it like this. Because I think that life and everything that we're doing right here and everything that you will continue to do from this day forward is all about continuing to learn about what is important and relevant to the culture and to you and to the people around you and sharing that with them and having honest discussions about it. And what I never want is to lecture to my children about this is how we did it back then and this is what was right. And I always want to say what's right for you and what's going on in the world and let's see how we can take that and make it work against everything else that I've learned. And that's really the journey of, of your personal life. And this is something that if you're not thinking about it, if you're not on it, if this is, if this is really just a little part of it. But solving this piece, getting this girl situation handled is so incredibly critical because if you're like maybe some clients who we've worked with, 
if you're like me at a certain point, then you really couldn't think about anything else until this thing was handled. And it becomes a very vicious cycle. So uh, I don't want to talk about business too much, but I would just say that um, I've started a bunch of companies now. I've been starting companies since I was 16 years old and more than a uh, social coach or anything that would put me up here, I consider myself an entrepreneur. So I will just mention this briefly, which is the things that I would say are important to discover in business and in your professional life, whether that be in academia or in software or in biotech or you know sales, are discovering your strengths and your gifts. And what I discovered are my strengths and gifts are a little bit different than Nick's strengths and gifts. They're a little bit different than David's. I try to leverage them as much as possible. And one of the things that I love about working with Nick, you can see his enthusiasm, you can see his passion. And the way that, you know, and, and we're not, a, we're not a, there's no longevity in this per se in the sense that I don't think I'm gonna, um, let me make sure I say that right. I don't think I'm gonna, um, you know, be holding your hand on my deathbed. Um, but we have sort of a business relationship that recognizes each of each other's mutual strengths and that um, you know, I'm able to say, look at this guy, he's doing amazing things, he's so good at what he does, and I try to be good at what I do, and just discovering what I'm good at and discovering other people around me who are good at what they do is one of the most important things you can start with in terms of success in business. Um, learning how to bring those forth is another big important part of it. If you are a software programmer and maybe you have a great idea for an architecture of some system you want to build, but you don't know how to communicate that properly to people. <coughs> that is a massive impediment to your growth in business. And so man learning how to communicate with other people, learning how to work in a collaborative environment, those are massive. And uh, you know, again, just little, little things I've learned over the years, but if you're not thinking about this, they're gonna get in the way. Um, learning how to leverage those things. So here's the next step, right, is we, to look at our business, and, and again, I mentioned we do this day in, day out. Um, the best thing we can do is not to work with one client every day for an hour a day. The best thing we can do is to put a DVD program together or something that lets our voice get out there as much as possible. If you're an author, it's to share your gift with the world in poetry or in writing as much as possible. If you are a software architect, it's to work at the company that is going to help get your code out there as much as possible. If that's not at a company, maybe that's through open source. Um, the point is, whatever your gifts are, Whatever your gifts to give to the world are, to create value in the world are, being able to leverage those as much as possible is really critical. And I don't want to sidetrack too much here, but I would say that we live in a society that thrives on the creation of value. To me, that's what capitalism is all about. This world, you get money when you give value to the world. And we'll leave the crack dealers aside for a second because they're simply feeding the need. But when you create value in the world, you get it back in the form of remuneration. And if you are really serious about what you're doing, you want to get that value back, and the best way you can do that is by leveraging your gifts and figuring out how to get them out there as best as possible. Um, eventually, and this is sort of where I've started to go, is you want to go from private enterprise and what you're doing in your own personal life to public good. And uh, you know, so we started, for example, our organization now supports a charity called Safe Horizon that funds shelters for victims of domestic abuse. And I find that it's within our mission to help show men that it's not just women who are out at the bar who you meet who need our attention, but it's women all over the place who you have never met before and who have suffered through all sorts of things that have closed them off. Um, I'm very close with a, a rape counselor who deals with women who have come in to the hospital who deal with rape. And uh, you know, it's, it's striking to me how I might go up to a woman at the bar and she might reject me. And there's any number of reasons she could. She could have rejected me because she doesn't like blonde hair, because I didn't come correct, or maybe she's got some issue in her past that closes her off from meeting new people. And uh, again, in, in our own lives, what we've really tried to do, in our in professional at least, is make this bridge between what we're doing at an enterprise level and what we're doing in terms of public good. And I'd only like to continue that. <coughs> so that's sort of the next step that I see that most people go through. And then finally, just like in your personal life, leaving a legacy, leaving a, a gift to people that they can grow from. And uh, any company that you look at, if Steve Jobs leaves Apple, hopefully uh, Apple will continue on. If, if he's left the legacy properly, they will. If he hasn't trained them properly, then they'll fall. Um, 
The last one I want to talk about, and this is something that's happened to me over the last few years, at the risk of becoming boring, and I'm going to get into the game stuff very shortly, but this is something that's become very important to me, is spirituality. I grew up a uh, Catholic, and I'm no longer a practicing Catholic, but I'm very spiritual after some experiences of my own. And having a relationship between yourself and something higher, at least for me, was something that I found I needed to develop, and it was something that I needed to experience beyond just going out and like, as cavalier as it sounds, like beyond just going out and hooking up with models, or beyond just going out and like building a business. And it was something that I needed to experience because I needed some grounding and, and something that sort of had a deeper meaning to me in life. And uh, if that's something that is on your path or something you've not explored yet, then I encourage you to do so. And I'm sure quite a few people in this room have read Power of Now. That's you know a great place, place to start. Um, but you know, how does this play out when you're interacting with a woman? How does this interact when you? How does this play out when you're actually in a pickup or in love with a person? I really believe that um, in every single moment there is a depth of experience that none of us know is possible until we fully throw ourselves into it. I don't want to get too, again, too spiritual, but if I am talking to a woman and I'm not fully engaged with her, I'm not fully giving myself to her, I don't, know every, I don't want to know every little thing about her. As Fran mentioned, if I'm not falling in love with her every step of the way, then I'm missing out on so much about her. Uh, I, was just in, uh, I was just in France and I was like running, right? So I go running along this like, this like oceanside trail and every single moment at every crest of the run, that's like my reward is when I'm able to get to that crest and see that beautiful horizon and feel my heart beating and know that I'm alive and know that in this moment there's something that's a lot deeper than me. And that is something that has increased the happiness in my life a hundredfold more so than any experience I had in a club in New York, more so than anything that came out of the money I had from building a business. So these are, in my mind, some of the paths that men can develop along. And I don't share them with you to tell you these are what you must do, that this is absolutely the right way, but more than anything, that uh, there are some things you may want to consider beyond this little realm that we're in and also contextualize this little realm that we're in. You know, the act of picking up a woman, the act of meeting her and getting to know her and maybe sleeping with her has so much in it that is about who we are in the world and what, how we see ourselves. We, um, in the DVD that you have there, hopefully, we talk about what we call frame of reality and how the moment that you're interacting with a woman, there's so much going on there in terms of how you see yourself, how she sees herself, and there's this gap between the two of you that is pregnant with possibilities. And if you don't bring yourself fully to that, and if you don't really believe in yourself, you're gonna miss out on a lot of those possibilities. So let's move on, because that's all sort of heady stuff. Um, I saw very few hands go up when we talked about, or when Nick brought up Conquer Campus. And I know that, um, I know that some of you are not 21, or I'm sorry, are older than 30. Some of you are in college. Who here, just by a show of hands, has read Conquer Campus? One, two, three, three, okay. So Conquer Campus is a book that um, I helped my friend Mark write about how to meet girls in college. And uh, if you haven't read it, I would highly suggest it. It's all about social circle game and being better with girls who, wh whether you're in like college or not, it's all about social circle game. One of the core tenets that we talk about in Conquer Campus is what we call giving love. Okay, and before this gets too new agey, uh, giving love has a lot of meanings. Nick, do you want to talk about giving love for a second? Do you want to grab the microphone? <coughs> yeah, stand up, man. I don't know. Matt? Yeah? I don't think it's on. There, there we go. go. So, you got All right, great. Um, giving love is an uh, expression we throw around at the social man very often. It's kind of like a whole like mantra, basically based around the idea that the more you give, the more you get back. It's our mantra because it's true. Don't question it, it just is. And, but here's the thing, giving love comes in a lot of forms when it comes to women. Um, giving <coughs> love could just mean a compliment. Hey, you look really pretty. Right, more up to the more of the face, better. Hey. You look really pretty. That's one way of giving love. Hey, 
I love you. That's another way of giving love. However, all giving love basically means is being able to give emotional excitement, being able to give emotional, like a positive emotional state inside of another human being. So when you take into the realm everything that we talk about, that means a lot of things. Sometimes if you give a girl some shit and tease her, oh my god, I can never talk to you. That's a form of giving love because she gets excited, she gets happy, yes you can. It's flirting, it's fun. Girls like things that make them feel good. So by giving love, limit yourself to everything that could possibly make another human being feel good, including giving them a little shit sometimes. And I want to talk about that for a moment. Touching them, because that feels good. giving shit thing, because what you talked about there is really illustrative of this whole notion of giving love. Illustrative, good word. Thanks, man. Um, So if you are saying to a person, and, and I know I've been guilty of this, if you're giving shit to a person, because you feel like they're giving shit to you, if you're like, I don't know if I can talk to you anymore, and you're legitimately a dick about it, you're like mean about it, and they feel that, then that's not giving love. That's making, their feel, that's making them hurt, okay? If you're like, oh yeah, I don't know if I can talk to you right now. Like you're kind of joking about it, you got a big smile on your face, a la Nick. You kind of like, just want to like amplify their emotional experience a little bit. That's what we mean by giving love. We mean it in a way where you are increasing somebody's emotional experience with you every step of the way. And it's not about being a dick, okay? Now, when we talk about things like negging, or like uh, teasing, or whatever, you know, common community terms, where are these things relevant? Where are these things important? They're important in as much as they allow somebody to lower their barriers so that we can give to them an openness, okay? And that's the thing I want to stress here is, if you go out with Nick, if you hang out with me, if you hang out with Fran, uh, well, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, any sort of interaction that we want to have with a woman is not about setting up walls that are so high that she can't get over them. It's about setting up very little walls that we want her to push down and pushing down her little walls too. Because that's what giving love is all about. If you think about the act of sex, okay, let's take this all the way to the end. Okay, when you are actually inside a woman and you are enjoying the act of it, okay? You are extremely vulnerable, okay? The knife-wielding maniac could run in, and you would be very challenged to defend yourself at that moment because you are so, hopefully, committed to that act. And that commitment to that act requires that level of openness. It requires that level of intimacy. So from the moment you go up and say hello, you are starting to make love to her. You are starting to give her something. And if you are not able to do that, you're not able to be open every step of the way, or not able to break down her walls, then you will start to lose her. So let's talk about um, a couple of little, like I was talking to somebody earlier who I'm pretty sure is like off in a couch asleep now. Um, I was talking to somebody earlier about like, you know, what are the issues that guys are facing right now? And my understanding is it's still a lot of the same stuff that it was five, six years ago when we got in, which is what to say, um, and having confidence to say it. Can, just by a show of hands, again, I know you guys are probably fucking sick of this. Just by a show of hands, who runs out of things to say when they're like talking to women in conversations? Okay, so a fair number, and that's probably, you came here more to talk about that than about God. Um, all right, cool. So we've really tried. <laughs> I'm jealous right now, man. I'm jealous. I know, where's mine? Um, we've really tried to. Um, We've, we've gone out, we use microphones, we like dissect what we do, like we break it all down, we try to figure out like, okay, like what are the things that we're saying and how can we teach this best? Because we don't use routines, we don't stack, we don't do any of the shit that like people have talked about for the long time. And it's harder to learn. That's that like barrier that you've got to push through and that's that stuff that like, that's what we're, I'm talking about when I'm saying you've got to put in the hard work. But we've really tried to break down at least very, some of the language patterns and some of the things that we do when we're going through conversations. So I'm going to give you a couple of them right now that I found are very easy at opening up conversations. If you were going to write anything down, this would probably not be a bad idea. So the first one, if you want to call it something, you could call it a comfort hook. Okay, and it's basically four steps of opening yourself up and sharing a little bit about a person. So the very first thing you do, you talk about yourself, you tell a little story, or you talk about a situation. I'm going to give you a very specific example of this in a moment, but I just want you to have the four steps there. So talk about yourself or situation. Um, second one, no, that's over there. 
Second one, you relate that to a high value story. There is a bit of DH being in there. Third one, you screen and qualify. And then the fourth one is you future project. Shockingly, these are all community terms. We do actually speak like this sometimes. So let me give you an example. Does, does that make sense to everybody? Like what I just said? You guys know those terms? Just like nodding or yes, no? Uh, all right, well, I'm getting no feedback at all. So I'll just assume that nobody does. Um, all right, so here's an example, right? Talk about yourself in a situation. This happened, this is a very good example. Um, I was in, I was back in Manhattan. Um, this is like maybe two months after the vacation I'd taken to Mexico, like a very spontaneous drunken vacation I'd taken to Mexico. Um, speaking of enjoying your single life. And so I was talking to this girl and I said, I mean, and again, this is, you know, Fran and Nick both gave some really good examples of how to get conversations started and the simplicity of it all. Here's another one where it's very simple. simple. Saw some eye contact, walked up, said, hey, what's up? Said, hey, what's up? I'm Christian, what's your name? She said, I'm so-and-so, what's your name? Uh, what? No, she didn't say that, because I just said I introduced myself. I said, um, I said, how's your night going? She said, good. I get, are you from the city? She goes, yeah, I am. I said, oh, cool, how long do you live here? So again, very dry conversation at this point, but there's a lot of eye contact going on, and there's a lot of that nonverbal stuff happening, and that's all that needed to happen at that point. So. Here's where the comfort hook starts to come in. So I said, how long have you been in the city? She says, blah, blah, blah. I said, so I, now I start to tell a story. I said, yeah, you know, like, I really love Manhattan, but I got to get out every now and then. It's like, it's, you know, it's, it's really tough if you're here, like, nonstop. When's the last vacation you took? Okay. So I'm trying to lead to the story that I've been talking about. So she said, oh, geez, last vacation I took, probably, like, six months ago. How about you? So she's essentially taking the bait, right? So now I can tell this little story. I was like, well, actually, um, let me think. Like two months ago, I guess, I was, uh, I was down in Mexico. She goes, Mexico, really? I said, yeah, actually, it's like crazy. Sunday night, it's like a karaoke at 3 a.m., really fucking wasted. And my friend Alice and I were like, let's get on a plane and go to Mexico. And that's actually the story. Um, so that's kind of a high value story. It indicates spontaneity. I'm going to a foreign country with a female friend. And there's like a big hook in there, right? And what that signifies is not only that I do these cool things, so that like builds a little bit of intrigue, and she's like, ah, oh, nice, you know, that's crazy, blah, blah, blah. I'm also able to say, yeah, it was like really spontaneous, like I've never really done anything too much like that before, and she's like, yeah, wow, that's so spontaneous. So now I screen and qualify, this is step three. I'm like, so what's, yeah, have you ever done anything like that? Okay, so now she's thinking, and now she's starting to work for me, and the whole point of me opening myself up and talking a little bit and sharing just a little bit with her, just enough, so that she can start to open up to me. And what I'm really trying to do, I'm not asking her if she goes down to Mexico. What I'm really trying to do is find a similarity of the personality traits. And spontaneity is not a bad personality trait to have if you're talking to girls. Um, hopefully, I mean, I, I would assume <coughs> guys like spontaneous girls. Uh, I certainly do. So I'm like, I'm like, yeah, I was like, really crazy. So like, have you done anything like that? She's like, well, blah, blah, and now she starts talking, right? So oftentimes, that's just as much work as you need to do to really get a person going, is to tell a somewhat high value story. You don't have to talk for that long. You don't have to share that much with her. You just have to share enough that she wants to start sharing with you and ask her a question about it, okay? So at this point, she told me a little story she did about like a trip to Peru where she did all this, um, this stuff called ayahuasca, which is kind of similar to acid, and, uh, but, but, but cooler. Um, and, uh, and so now here's the fourth part of our little sequence here is I said, oh wow, that, that is pretty spontaneous. So we talked about that for a second. Now I future project with her. I said, okay, so here's, here's the planned vacation, all right? First, we're gonna get drunk at karaoke. What's your favorite song? She's like, Total Eclipse of the Heart. You're a winner. Um, so we talked about that. And I'm like, okay, first we're gonna get drunk at karaoke. And that's my contribution to the trip. And then we're gonna go to Peru and just trip out for seven days and like experience Zen and each other in all sorts of crazy ways that we never knew existed. So you can see how through these four sequences, it's like a very simple sequence. It's just telling a little story about myself that relates to a very situational manner. If you noticed again, I started by talking about New York. I moved into life in New York and how I need to get out every now and then. And any of you can do this. If you're here tonight just visiting, how many, uh, you know, I'm not even gonna fucking show of hands. 
Um, if you're here tonight just visiting, you could say something like, yeah, I just flew into Orlando today. How long have you been living here? And she could say, you know, do you live here? She'll probably say, yeah. You say, um, you say, yeah, like this is a great vacation city. Like I'm thinking of going to Disney World. What's the last vacation you took? So now you're talking about something she did. So that's all, that's like all the commonality you need. And she starts talking about a vacation. She says, I went to, let's say she says I went to Italy. Uh, who'd you go with? Okay, that's kind of an obvious question at least to me. Who'd you go to Italy with? She says, I went with my family. Now you've got a personality trait you can start to relate to. Okay? You can say, oh, really? You went with your family? Are, are you close to your family in that way? She says, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you can start to tell a little bit of story about who, whether you're close to your family or not, if you've taken family vacations with your, them or not. And you can say, well, I'll tell you what, like, I don't know you that well yet, so maybe we won't go on an Italian vacation with your family. But like, you know, get to know each other a little bit better. Like, at least I can meet them for like an Italian dinner. So, that's like kind of how you're gonna use these techniques. And again, if you think about what we're doing, just talking about yourself a little bit, talking about a story that's got just enough of a hook to make her want to continue to talk to you, screening and qualifying her on her personality, and then doing a little uh, future projection. So let's do another one. And this is, uh, this is very, very, very similar, okay? But a lot of guys uh, that we work with have a really hard time like being natural and just like starting basic conversation. Now, I've, and again, I, I'm talking entirely within the context of New York City here because we, we live there, we work there. Um, that's kind of where we do our stuff. With that said, um, you know, you can use this stuff anywhere. But a very common conversation for New Yorkers to have, and especially my, my guy friends who are naturals, so to speak, the guys who don't study game or study pickup, a very, very common conversation for them to have is to start the conversation, how long have you lived in the city? Or what do you like about it? Okay, that's just like, how people often talk to each other when they're getting to know each other. It's a simple topic, okay? So, you, what you're gonna do is you're gonna say hello, you're gonna make your introduction, hey, what's up, I'm Christian, what's your name, blah, 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 Some basic eye contact. She kind of tells you a little bit about it, okay? So, then you tell a little story, you start off, okay? And, and again, if you wanna write four steps here, if you found that last one useful, you might find this one useful too. So you tell your introduction, then you uh, tell a little story, you start with the story, it doesn't have to be very long. Okay. Second one is going to be a question based on my story. And this is very similar again to the last one. Third is going to be a question based on her answer. And the fourth is going to be one of these future projections or role plays. So Again, if you want to use this tonight with respect to anything you're doing, just replace the word New York with the word Orlando, and you're in. So, uh, you know, so she says, um, so your question is, how long have you lived in New York? She says, I moved here three years ago. I've lived here my whole life, blah, 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 blah. You ask a very basic question. You ask, what do you like about it? Okay, you don't have to get too complicated here, okay? Um, she tells you what she likes about it. And let's say, uh, let, let's say she, you know, she's like, ah, you know, I, I just think it's really fun. Like, everybody here is really friendly, blah, blah, blah. You say, okay, so, and then you kind of ask a question based on her answer. Okay, so you say, so, so like, oh, so it's really fun. Like, do you, like, is it easier to, like, find trouble in the city? Like, is, and this is what I would say. I'd be like, like, straight up, like, I'm from New York. Bars stay open until 4 a.m. there. Like, they close at 2 a.m. here. I'm a little worried that you guys don't know how to party proper. So, so I'd say, I'd say, yeah, you know, you guys know how to get crazy. She's going to, yeah, yeah, we know how to party. I'd be like, all right, all right. So um, what's a good story that's happened to you since living in the city? Now, this is a huge nuance right here that I really want you guys to think about for a second. The gamey way to ask this question is like, what's the craziest thing that's happened since you've lived in this city? Okay, the way that I personally ask it is, what's a good story that's happened since you've been in this city? And any time you ask a person to answer in a superlative, like the most of anything, <coughs> it makes them think a lot more than if you just ask them like a little bit of information. So if you're really deep into a conversation with somebody, you can say, what's the craziest thing that's happened since you got into the city? Or like, tell me a story about when you got arrested. You can ask that when you're deep into a conversation. If you don't know them very well, if you're just getting started, you can't do that, like, what's the craziest thing? You can't do any of those superlatives. You just have to go like basic. What's something good that, like, okay, tell me, how, tell me how you guys party. Like, what's something good that happens here? So you just get that going a little bit. And then the last thing you do is future projection. So this is step four. 
oh cool, we gotta do that together. That sounds awesome, okay? Maybe you guys do know how to party. So that's kind of how we try to get conversations going. And if you're doing that properly, if you're screening her at this point, because notice who's leading the conversation. Okay, I'm the one who's saying, I've got some values, I'm coming in, I'm cool, I'm having fun, what do you got? If you're doing this proper, she's gonna start to test you back a little bit. She's like, okay, so what do you guys do up there? Like, oh, you, dude, you don't even know. Like, all right, I'll tell you a little bit. And then you can start to get playful a little bit. You can start to do all the body language stuff that Nick was talking about. Um, all right, I'll tell you, so, the, so there's two little techniques that you can use at the very early stage of the conversation. A third one I'm gonna give you is, uh, this actually just happened on a date the other night. Um, it kind of came up spontaneously, and I remembered it as I was coming down here. I thought it was kind of funny. And it follows the same paths that a lot of my escalations take verbally. So what I'm always trying to do with the girl when I'm talking to her is be cooperative. Okay? I don't want to be like combative. I want to push her away just, just when I sense that she needs a little bit of a push. But generally, I want to like make a cooperative seduction. I want her to be a part of it. I want her to be enjoying it. So this is a really good illustrative example. Like, there's that word again, illustrative. Um, so I was talking with her about, um, we were talking about like celebrities. I was like, yeah, so who's your favorite celebrity? She's like, oh, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, all right, that's, that's all I want to do. Like, who's your favorite guy celebrity? She's like, oh, probably blah, 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 like an actor. I'm like, okay, who's your favorite guy celebrity that you want to hook up with? Okay, so we're three questions in, not too much so far. She's like, wow, hmm, I don't know. So she thought about it for a second. She said, uh, Holly Berry's husband. And I, I what? You're, yeah, obviously. obviously. <laughs> Nick wants Brad Pitt, but you know. Um, I've never seen Holly Berry's husband, but I was like, so I'm trying to think cooperatively, bring them together, like how can I be a part of this? I go, Holly Berry's husband, that's interesting, I've never seen him. So I let her talk a little bit. Again, I'm trying not to do too much talking. Okay, I'm like, Holly Berry's husband, what's he all about? Is he a black guy, white guy, like what? She's like, yeah, he's a black guy, like really great ass. Like, cool, you into asses? She's like, you know, like, she's looking at mine, she's like, not so much, but like he's got a nice one. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I got nothing. And uh, yeah, and she's kind of describing it a little bit. I'm just like trying to get her talking, right? And finally, I'm like, well, you know what? Like, that sounds pretty good. Like, I might be able to put up with that if Holly Berry was there too. So again, I'm trying to bring those together. So I'm like, yeah, because Holly Berry's pretty hot. I totally love to hook up with her. I was like, I'll tell you what, we should, we should like, we should like hook up with them. She's like, what? Like, we should go pick them up and hook up with them. I'm like, no, fuck no. We should have a foursome with them. Like, what are you talking about? So at this point, like, you know, because of the chemistry we had, because of the nonverbals and everything, she burst out laughing, great moments, you know, really enjoyed each other. And then, of course, as Nick alluded to earlier, we were able to start talking about foursomes and other sordid sexual matters, okay? So this is how you can sort of transition, again, from very basic conversation. Who's your favorite celebrity? Who's your favorite celebrity male? Who's your favorite celebrity male you'd like to hook up with? Figure out who they're dating, because if Chances are, if she wants to date some lead, hook up with some leading man who's dating some hot girl, say, let's have a foursome together, go from there. Um, so those are a couple of like, you know, very specific <coughs> techniques, some things that if you work on them, if you work them into your language, they will work for you. Okay, and this is really how we've started to teach and how we try to work with people, is by listening to their language patterns, listening to like the way that they structure stuff and trying to make them instinctively think how can I make this cooperative? How can I escalate? How can I get to know her better? Um, what Nick was alluding to earlier also, um, for those of you who saw what he was doing with Erica and using, uh, yeah, and like using uh, um, like sort of barriers. So Nick talked a little bit about barriers. If you don't know what barriers are, it's one of those like, I would so such and such if all these people weren't here. Like I would so hook up with you right now if all these people weren't here. So we have a little term for this which is called polarity escalation. We do this all the time, okay, where we're escalating very hard non-verbally. Okay, like, you saw what Nick was doing, it's that, plus something. You know, we're really, like, pushing the boundaries, pulling the girl in, talking to her ear, maybe, you know, nibbling on her, uh, on, on this part, what do you call this, the uh, bell of the ear? Earlobe? Ear lobe? Yeah, thanks. Uh, long fucking day. Yeah, sorry guys, I was up to six though. Um, Still no excuse, but uh, yeah, so like nibbling on this, you know, and obviously she's gotta be feeling it, but you're doing that while you're accusing her of seducing you. This is like nothing new under the sun. It's old school stuff, but it works, okay? And I think oftentimes we're like looking for answers where we don't need to. So if you're like using a barrier, if you're like, yo, like stop seducing me as you're biting her on the earlobe, 
it's kind of sexy for her. She's like, what are you talking about, Mr. Nick? I, mean, just, I know what you're doing. Like, you gotta stop, and then you make that eye contact with her. You know, pull away, as Nick kind of did. I didn't say that. <laughs> Those in the back, they probably didn't hear that, but um, you can share it with them later. So, so yeah, it's like that sort of stuff. And then you know, you pull away, you look her in the eyes, and you're like, you're like, I, I swear, you gotta like stop making this eye contact with me. Like this is really driving me crazy. So all the stuff where you're accusing her of being the one leading the escalation while you're leading it, and then knowing when to give in, and knowing when to say, all right, you've got me. And this is the subtlety that Nick sort of talked about with respect to calibration. Okay? This is one of the hardest things that I think any guy going through this experience has to learn is how to feel what a woman is feeling. I don't know if you've all ever experienced something like this. There's a girl in your life who's got great girl game. Like every guy you know is really into her. Okay? And uh, what is it she's doing? She knows how to turn on her sexuality and then how to pull it back. She knows how to give you a dose of that sexuality and make you feel like, oh, she, I didn't know she wanted me. Wow, that feels great. And then all of a sudden she pulls it away from you. Okay? It's that same dance. It goes back and forth. And the question is, who's leading that dance? Who's the one who's initiating with that sexuality and who's giving it to her? And that's what you use polarity escalation with. And the second part of this is, with respect to being a man, like working less for rapport and working more for escalation. Okay, this is a really, and I, I know it's late in the day, I know this is like a weird concept, but think of it this way. Like most of us, when we're trying to learn this stuff, when we're trying to like get better with women, what we're really trying to get better with, perfect, is rapport, okay? We're really trying to like build that bridge with her. You need to work less during that time period than you probably think you do. You only need to ask some very basic questions. You need to be like able to say quick little things like, you know, oh, we should go do that together, that'd be amazing. But like, I don't want to get in trouble with you, so like, we'll keep it PG. You know, kind of like what these, these two were doing up here. Um, little stuff like that will keep her going. And then just ask another question, ask another question, ask another question. You don't need to be working that hard for rapport, and you don't need to be telling her long-winded stories about yourself. If you've ever found yourself talking for more than like five minutes to a girl who you haven't known for 30 minutes, you're doing it wrong. Okay? You don't need to be talking that much. And I, don't want to, and I don't want to be dogmatic about that. There's plenty of guys who have success doing it that way. Um, I just find I'm a little lazier than that, and I don't want to put that much work in the beginning. What I do want to do is when she's starting to feel it, when she's giving me her hips, when she's into me, when she's excited by me, and when she has started to open up to me, that is the most critical part of all this, is trying to get this girl to open up to me. That's when I want to lead with sexuality. I want to lead with the escalation, because I am the man, we are all men in here, and we are the ones who should be pushing that forward. Okay? And uh, this gets into the last part of this little talk here, which is that one of the things we, I think all of us really believe, and certainly Nick and I, is that there's nothing more arousing for a woman than to be desired by a man who she values. Okay? And that was a tough concept for me to get for a while because I grew up feeling like I could not express my sexuality and I could not express my desire for people and that it was uh, the girl's job to chase me a little bit, and that um, you know, if I was cool enough, if I had enough social value, or if I had good enough game or whatever, she was just gonna like, fall on my lap. And for all the reasons that Nick's discussed regarding society and the way that we're brought up, it's not her job. It's not even her job, not because of society, I think biologically and evolutionarily. Is that a word? Evolutionarily. Um, so, you know, it, it is really our job as men to be the one who lead the charge with escalation, and who lead the charge with sexuality, and who lead the charge with making her feel like you want her. But you can only do that once she values you a little bit. And how is she going to value you when she opens up to you? And when is she going to open up to you when she feels like you're genuinely interested in her? When you've got a couple interesting things to say and share about your life. So um, I'll sort of share this with, um, I'll share it with you one last story before I uh, kind of bounce here, which is, that there was a girl uh, in my kitchen, this is maybe three months ago now, and we were sitting on my countertop, each drinking a glass of wine. So everything indicated that, you know, things were good, that we were gonna hook up, blah, 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 blah. It was our second date, we like cooked together. And I was like very clumsy in my escalation. Like nothing was coming to me, my game wasn't on. We were just like, we were just in rapport. We were just like talking, sharing shit. Like there was no like, 
uh, everything you saw demonstrated up here, it wasn't happening. Okay? It was just like, we were just sitting there and I could see she was like, dude, Christian, like, come on, pick it up. Let's, let's go here, I want to look up. So I was just like, you know what? Like, I just looked her dead in the eye. I was like, I would really like to hook up with you right now. Or make out with you right now, sorry. And she looks at me and she's like, um, I don't know, that might be kind of awkward. <laughs> um, at least that's what I thought in my head. But going through this so many times now, and understanding this process, and understanding that she did value me, that she was there for a reason, that she had that glass of wine in her hand and was sitting on my countertop for a reason, understanding all those things, kind of that all clicked in, that all went through my head. And I just reminded myself, you know what? She just wants to know that I really want her. She just wants to know that like, I desire her. And the way she demurred was not like, oh my god, no. You know, it wasn't like that. It was just like, I don't know, it'd be like a little awkward. So I took her hand, I took her head in the back of my hand, started to move it towards myself, and I was just like, no, it'll be amazing, trust me. Started making out, and we actually dated for uh, a couple weeks thereafter. But, um, but uh, you know, the point is, I would have taken that initial statement from her maybe five, ten years ago as a massive sign of rejection. I said, shit, like, I totally messed it up with this girl. I'm an awkward guy. Girls don't like me. I, I'm just going to throw in the towel. I've been like, oh, sorry. Okay, yeah, you're right. And she would have been disappointed, and I would have been disappointed, and we all would have walked away. But understanding that she just wanted to feel my desire was the breakthrough that actually let me escalate on her when she just needed to feel my strength. And, you know, there's a line here. There's a very fine line when no really does mean no. But there's so many times when there is token resistance, where there is somebody who really just wants to feel your strength as a man, who wants to know that like you have that love to give them, and you're going to share that with them, and you're gonna go after it with them. And uh, you know, that's sort of where I wanna leave you guys, is that if you are willing to like step up to the plate, if you are willing to actually accept this responsibility of like bringing love into women's lives and doing awesome things with them, a big part of that is being able to push past that rejection because it is your fucking responsibility as a man. As Nick likes to say, for uh, braving the fire of rejection. Because every rejection you get, at least in my life, has been a test. Rejections in business have been a test of my you know, ability to deal with challenging situations. Rejections in my personal life have been a test of my ability to like, get over certain people. Rejections in that moment are a test. How much of yourself can you bring yourself forward? Or can you bring forward? And every time that you feel rejected, every time that you look at that, you can look at it as a failure or you can look at it as an opportunity to learn a little bit about yourself and to like push yourself forward and make yourself a bit of a better person. And it's only by doing that that you will really achieve mastery of this part of your life. So thank you for sticking with me. I apologize, my energy level's been a little bit low. I think everybody in the room is feeling it, but uh, thank you very much. I think we're going to do, a, if anybody has questions, we're going to do a Q&A panel or just a beer pong game. Either way. Uh, are there any questions? All right. What is polarity escalation? Uh, is that different from like regular escalation? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it's, it's exactly like what I was describing, down. which is essentially using a barrier verbally, where you're saying, "Why are you doing this to me? Stop it! Your, you know, your your feminine charms are having their way on me. Stop looking at me that way." All that stuff verbally to essentially tell her to stop escalating while you're the one who's actually doing the physical and nonverbal escalation. That's the easiest way. Does that make sense? And Nick wants to say something too. Yeah, just to clear that up. Um, yeah. It's where your, your verbals are saying hard no, but your, your nonverbals are saying hard yes. I talked about how 
the, the nonverbals kind of lubricate the process. So if you're if you're nonverbal, they're saying no, 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 slow down. It's you, it's you, it's you. That allows you to get away with much more on the nonverbal level, level, keeping her conscious mind kind of occupied and out there dealing with all the ho hum shit. Oh no, this is perfect. Meanwhile, on the subconscious level, her body can really start to enjoy all the shit that it wants to enjoy. Make sense? Yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, that, that's good. Yeah, Christian, you mentioned the three <coughs> macro areas, and um, I think you touched on personal life, and to me, uh, the three main areas of my life would be health, wealth, and probably relationships. I'm not sure if you mentioned the other two. Yeah, well, the way that I would look at that, and, and I guess you can, you can cut it up any way you want, um, and again, I'm not saying my way is best by any stretch. Um, and, and health has actually become a much more important part of my life recently, uh, after a two-year sort of hiatus from any sort of exercise. Um, but uh, I would put that in the personal growth area because it's not business and professional, and it's not spiritual. I mean, you could have you could have a spiritual moment in the gym, I suppose. But I put that in terms of like personal growth and what you're trying to achieve with yourself. And what was the third one you said? Relationships. I'd put that in personal life as well because that's love, openness. That's almost independent from business. Think of it this way, right? If you're in a relationship, and I've been in this situation, you're in a relationship, it's maybe a little too much, a little too much for you to handle. Maybe the girl's really insecure and she's like just clinging on to you. Maybe there's all sorts of fights. You're not gonna be able to commit yourself as much as you need to probably to your profession. So it's getting in the way in that sense. And if your business is fucked and you're not able to work on it and you're running on debt and you're like you know, eating protein shakes every day, which I've done and it's not fun, um, it's very hard to have any sort of space for anything else in your life as well. So I, th that's the way that I cut those up. I mean, because you can still be living on protein shakes but doing 100 push-ups a day. So that's kind of how I try to cut those up is like, personal life is anything related to you, professional life is anything related to your work, your finances, and like the legacy you're trying to leave that way, and then spiritual is the third one. But again, you can cut them up however you want. All right, thanks. You, yeah, yeah, did you have a second question? Or? Okay, that's all. Okay, cool. Nick, Nick had something to add, shockingly. I remember somebody was just talking about how it was hard for them yeah. to keep their professional life separate from their um, relationship life, or their, yeah, being able to have a relationship and be able to do their professional thing. And, and so you were, you were grouping them together, but I wanted to talk on this one specific facet, because I know it's a lot, of, a lot of times a lot of guys think, hey, I've got my personal life, I've got my social life. But I, what I wanted to kind of bridge together there and kind of what you were talking about and elaborate on is that anyone will kind of agree with me on this. If you've got an amazing woman in your life, if you've got an amazing woman, two women, three women, four women in your life, um, this is all in Eckhart Tolle, Power Now, David Data, Way of the Superior Man, they all agree with me. But a woman has the power to, to bring out the best, bring out your, your strongest, bring out your most masculine, a good woman. If you've got a shitty woman who's got her own shit, she's gonna bring you further down with her. But if you've got a great woman who actually knows her place, she has the amazing power to bring more masculinity, more power, more goodness that you can put towards your own professional life, that you can put anywhere you want to, than you ever freaking dreamed of. I mean, so in that seen, way, they're ever, very tied. If you've ever seen the movie, again, 300 is a great example of, you know, two lines she says. She says, you know, we're the only women who are strong enough to give birth to sparking men. That's why we can speak to other men. That was a good one. And then the other one, you know, you see King Leonidas comporting with her the night before he goes out to battle. And she's, she's the one who's, who's providing him that strength and saying, I think when they, she leaves, she says, uh, you know, something like, come home, uh, come home with your shield or on it. You know, but she's the one who's pushing around the world. I don't want to demonize women and say that they'll drain on you, because as Nick said, a great woman can be as much of an additive element to your life as a bad woman can be subtracted. Um, yeah, anything else? I one think we're wrapped up here, guys. Oh, did, was there one more? Was there one more question? Oh. No, we're set. Good stuff, fellas. All right, hey. Oh, Anthony? Uh, one more Three. question, oh. and then uh, we've got to cut it. Yeah, yeah, I think we're, I think people are out of questions and possibly out of steam. Out of questions? <laughs> are you kidding me, guys? You're crazy. But, but uh, that's it, then we'll wrap it up. Did, did you guys want to, hey, and I, just as long as you're sitting up here, like, you know, taking advantage of this wonderful couch, did you guys have anything you wanted to add about anything I talked about? Or, like, David, you got anything you want to say? Not really. All right. Francis? Um, I, uh, 
Talk to the mic. Talk to the, yeah, talk, talk to the mic. I dipped out for like half your speech because I had that coughing attack, but uh, uh, so I didn't get to catch right. everything. But right. you uh, you nailed it, bro. All right. Oh, thanks. <laughs> All right. Thanks again, guys. And uh, a round of applause. Yes, sir.